All right, peace family. Welcome to the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. Today we're going to do something that might not be too, you know, appropriate, but it's going to be we're going to we're going to see how much of the ISIS papers was pseudoscience, and it's going to be a live conversation with Afro N8V. Uh, oh, sorry. You said what? Oh, native. Okay, Afro Native, uh, Asani, you know, Asani, come, come, come through on Discord and join the chat, and of course others, so you, you can see that there are others here, and uh, let's get right into it. This was Afro Native's idea, so Afro Native, let us know. What, what, go on. The ISIS Papers, The Keys to the Colors by Dr. Francis Crest Wilson. And, you know, uh, as critical thinkers, we got to read through this book and pick out what we can use and what we shouldn't use. But, you know, I get a lot of, from our community, we hear about how it's, you know, this great book. And, like, I don't really hear the criticism coming out of our community. So, as a critical thinker, I have to do my due diligence and go through every line and see what is suitable you know, let's pick out what is pseudoscience areas where Dr. Francis Chris Wilson shouldn't have really gone into because she is a psychiatrist. So we have to recognize that up front. She's a psychiatrist and she goes into different areas that outside of her study area, outside of her field. Uh, so brother. I got a couple of areas where I think, you know, she shouldn't have said certain things like outside of her study scope and other areas that I think are good to take and implement. So, uh, brother, let me ask you this I don't know how y'all want to get started. Before we uh, get into it too much, introduce yourselves. And, uh, you know, introduce yourself. Uh, most definitely. Most definitely. So, uh, Afro Native, I'm a poet, I'm an author, I'm an independent scholar, and I like studying. So, before. Uh, I want to explain this, the background I have. So I have studied anthropology for over 10 years independently. So like some of the things I've read in this book, they come off as pseudoscience mm. when you know anthropology. Facts. But that's the perspective I'm coming from on this book here. Oh, yeah. So I, I want to say, uh, Isani said that she can't make it because she has to... Uh, I mean, she, she's, on, she's on the YouTube chat, so she'll probably chat us on the YouTube, but the Discord's not working for her. Uh, for whatever reason, so uh, I mean, she said why, but you know, the point, the main, the main lesson is that she'll probably be in the YouTube chat. So, Asani, if you ever want to chip in, just let us know. And we could, uh, we could read it whenever you type it, okay? Uh, but all right, yeah, brother. So, okay, so anthropology. So, give us an example of of, of what what's what. Like, what wh why why would why would we even use the word pseudoscience? So if somebody has studied like cultural anthropology, the origins, you know, these various human ethnic groups, you know, they're going to read, I mean, we, before we get into that, like, I'll let the rest of the people introduce themselves, but I got some pages that we can look at, we can read through, and then I would like to hear what y'all think of it. All right. Uh, anybody else want to, oh, Kush, Kush, you, 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 you're technically on the panel. I think these other people are just listening. I don't know. But if, if you guys want to... <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to uh, chip in, let, let, let us know. Introduce yourselves. Yeah, Kush. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm basically just uh, an avid reader of uh, uh, Dr. Francis. I've been following her uh, for the past maybe six months now. Uh, previously, I've read mostly uh, books concerning uh atheism I'm, I'm an atheist just so that everyone knows nothing um i i take nothing from anything spiritual from the book for example but uh, i take everything from that book as a lesson on how we can uh, strategize uh moving forward as a black nation but uh yeah so coming into this book i i got introduced into it like 20, back in 2013 i never touched it started reading it this year and uh, I think uh, Roots King saw, saw my tweet on, on, on Twitter and they, they 
invited me, uh, but I was really I, that my, that tweet was, came from uh, me reading those two chapters and just being blown, you know, almost confirming what I've been uh, I've been I've been thinking about for a long time. But anyway, uh, I'm from Africa, born and bred Africa. I would say I don't want to put myself in one corner of Africa because I think uh, I'm African before I'm, I'm even you know, from anywhere else. I've lived in, in the DRC, in Congo, uh, South Africa, Angola, Mozambique. So I've moved around and now I've settled where I'm working right now in Angola. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, this is me. Well, um, thanks for the invitation. I hope we can share some uh, some good information on this uh, podcast. Okay, so uh, just to, just to be clear, Gaza and uh, Show, you guys are introducing yourselves, or are you just uh, chilling? Okay, I mean <laughs> that's all the answer you need, right? Uh, <laughs> all right, so so Kush, you sound like you you like this book. You sound like it, it's a really valuable. So let us know why do you like this book? What, what is so good about the book? Uh, to you? It's just yeah, for me. Uh, I know a brother uh, was talking about uh, pro black. How should I call you, pro black? Oh, you can call me Oni. Sorry, my name is Oni, guys. Oni, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so I, I know you. Uh, that previously we were speaking about if, if she she is a psychologist, yeah, and uh, um, she shouldn't be. I mean, she is a scholar first of all. The, the respect that I give this book is that she she, she uh, gives references to studies that have been done in genetics and she has all her references there uh, and going forward the, the symbolism that she has put forward for us to look into you can look into it yourself you don't have to just read the book but think it just from experience and from what other books have read and from the perspective of a black woman uh, that just gives me a lot more depth it just gives me a lot more respect of what she's saying. I know she's, it's not, obviously it's not a perfect book. I, I could pick holes in the book. Like I said, spiritual things that don't really, uh, being an atheist, not, not, not believing in anything spiritual per se or mystic, uh, I can pick holes and say, okay, that, but in overall, what she's trying to put out and what she's trying to put out in, uh, in all of her books and all her speakings, is the awakening of the black man, especially male black man. Mm. Okay. Well, Af Afro Native, you got anything to say about that, or not really? It looks like we got Asani in the building, so we can let her introduce herself. Oh, Asani's in the building. Okay. Hey, Asani, how you doing? You want to introduce yourself? Hey, Asani. All right, when she comes on, uh, I don't know if she can hear us. Hey, Sonny, can you hear us? All right, she's not saying anything. But, uh, All right, so, so question for Kush. Kush, have you read the whole book from beginning to end? Yeah, I've read it. So usually what I do with books is I, I, I would start with, uh, I'll start with the audio book. So I'd say I've, I've gone through the audio book. And usually with books that I really... I really want to understand. I would read it twice or three times to just get the the actual message from it. Yes, yeah, so I've, I've actually read the book once at least, and I'm reading it the second time now. Okay, so from your perspective, would you say that the overall book you recommend the whole book in its entirety? If you were to, you know, you have a child, you have a son and daughter, you would you give this the book to them and say, read this book from beginning to end and believe every word in. Or would you pick and choose things that they should follow? I would, I would pick and choose, but I, I would give them the book, like I, just like I'll give my son the Bible to read or the Quran to read, uh -oh. so he, he gets knowledge. Oh yeah, exactly. Like any other book, the Man Craft or the Hitler's book and whatever, I'll give them a book to read. I wouldn't stop them. What I would say is, come back to me and we can speak about the things that your father believes 
are not uh, real. I know that book, like I said, the book is not perfect. I uh, can pick holes in it and say, okay, I totally don't agree with that, but I understand why she's doing it. And what, because I don't take it as a, can I say, as a scientific, totally scientific book that someone can, can uh, guide their life by. But it, it, it is definitely a sort of a guideline. That's what I'm saying. You, would, you don't have to believe everything that's in that book. Uh, that, that's my perspective. All right. right, so and this book, the way it was written, is basically a compilation of essays she wrote from like back in 1969 up to the 80s. So it's over 10 years she compiled these different essays and she put this book together based off of that. So like what I found myself was, especially like in the beginning part of the book, the first chapters, she repeats herself a lot. And there's certain concepts that she repeats consistently throughout the book, even if they're erroneous. So like it's redundant, it's very redundant, in my opinion. So, let, what, give, me, give us an example. Yeah, give us an example. Of what you said, but give us an, an example. All right. All right, so we can get into that, right? So, one of the theories that she repeats over and over again, without being, you know, she's not an anthropologist, is the, the origins of white people. And I believe that to be false. So her theory is white people came from African albinos that were rejected out of Africa, got kicked out of Africa, and then because of that, they hated Africans. Mm. So I have never heard that theory anywhere else. And I can read this to you on page 128. 128? Oh, there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it goes like this. The basis for certain specific patterns of word usage in the white supremacy system culture is impossible to fully comprehend without an understanding of the origin of that system culture. White supremacy, racism began with the production of the first albino mutants from black mothers and fathers in Africa. Once isolated, these recessive genetic mutants began to mate with one another and multiply, producing what is now known as the white race. The white race historically has sought to hide its genetic origins in Africa amongst blacks, just as it has sought to deny the origins of the white civilization from the culture of blacks in Africa, seeking instead to proclaim an origin amongst the Greeks. So, do you all believe in that theory? Yeah, I, I see that. That's another thing that that like a, a lot of. That's one of the things I want to say too. That a lot of this whole book is. Uh, like like almost the whole book is pseudoscience. I want to say that uh, in the sense of you you know genetic recessiveness, right? Is not something that you can actually claim for white people. In so far, in so much as uh, I mean genetic recessive, they are genetic recessive in to a certain extent, but not to an entire extent. They're not holistically recessive. So. Something like blue eyes is recessive. Something like blonde hair is recessive. But to say that white people themselves are recessive is is an overstatement, you know? And, and it's an overstatement. And the only reason why somebody would call white people uh, recessive is because they, uh, they misunderstand. I mean, because essentially because we use the one-drop rule in America. So, so from, from the one-drop rule... It would say that uh, essentially the one drop rule would go and say that uh, Obama, like give Obama as an example, Obama is a black man, right? By the one drop rule, right? And and Obama looks like a black man. And for what it's worth, in America, Obama does look like a black man. Uh, in America, he looks like a black man. But 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 that's like a really but because America is a one drop society. So, because America is a one-drop society, Obama looks like a black man. I'm mean, sorry, looks like a black man. But if you, when you, when you, when you step out of, but, but when you look at how he looks compared to his father, right, like or how he would look in Kenya, and among his father's people, then you realize that the white woman, his white mother, was not recessive, or his, yeah, his white mother was not recessive, but instead that he looks like a blend between his two parents. And when you look like a blend between your two parents, that means that it's not recessive. And, and, and just to just to 
just to clarify what that you know what what really genetic dominance or genetic recessiveness means you know it's the example of a purple flower uh, a red flower and a, and, and, and a white flower right if if you mix a red flower and a white flower and the white flower is recessive then the offspring will look red but it will carry the genes of the white flower you know uh, but but that that's to say that in, in a perfectly red flower and a perfectly white flower it would be recessive but what you have in real life I mean what you would have in a non recessive situation is a red flower and a white flower will make a pink flower and so and so that's a non recessive relationship and that's what you have when you see Obama or when you see you know mixed people in general is that they look like a blend of their two parents and because they and, and so maybe they won't get the blue eyes maybe they won't get the blonde hair right and maybe they'll just carry those genes but but the idea that white people are entirely genetically recessive is completely false and and because it's, but but it's the whole basis of the book you know the whole basis of the book is that you're going to find it. so so the whole idea of the albinos you know so as you know just to address the question the whole idea of the albinos being uh, these these people that you know uh, were, were the were the ancestors of white folk it's it's not like, like you said it's not it's not really the case uh, it's not it's not the case at all in the sense that you know as you said anthropologically you know we know that the original inhabitants of Europe were brown you know so it, it would not make sense that they are also the al albinos that traveled out of Africa and not just that but white people don't look like albinos albinos look like black people but they just have lighter skin you know um, exactly and that's why I want to chime in because Currently on the continent, there's a lot of anti-albinism, right? You know, albinos is doing some research a couple of days ago. For example, in Tanzania, you know, there's a uh, they get their body parts cut off. You know, there's uh, superstition and mythology involved with African albinos. You know, and um, so like it goes as far as to like they sever the body parts, they crush the bones, and this is supposed to cure. They they have these myths that albino bones cure anything and it, they bring good luck and so albinos they're referred to as ghosts so like because of that and then with this reference in this book i think it becomes dangerous because it, it will promote that anti-albinism on the continent so now if continental africans read this book tanzania for example they'd be like okay now i have more of a reason to kill these albinos yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can I jump in? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I understand where you're coming from, saying that coming from Africa as well. I mean, there is yes prejudice, and these are uh, practices uh, that are being uh, slowly but surely uh, we're getting rid of these uh, of these practices. Yes, and a lot of uh, cultures in Africa have practiced some some questionable things and uh, we are yet to find out when when it, exactly i think um, chancellor williams uh, touched on this a little bit in, in his book that some of the some of our people were who were dispersed uh, or dispersed from the, the the greater kingdoms became almost like uh, uh, savages and such things but what i'm saying is in our cultures, in most cultures, uh, like you have the Bakongos and then you have the Zulus and such things, those that were a little, they were a, a bit more civilized or more organized didn't practice those uh, those uh, kinds of, uh, of things. But th that's a subject that we can debate another time. But what she meant, what I think from that book, she didn't mean it as uh, she didn't mean it as. Uh, as a derogatory uh, term uh, to put as if the al al albinos and the white people are all the same and they they are they are recessive in, in that way what i would like to say is like she, she's not defending that these people are recessive and they'll die off one day she's saying that and she wasn't she isn't the only one who said such things and before that there, there is a citation from uh, a doctor a psychologist uh, called uh, Arthur Schopenhauer a German who says the white color of skin is not the, it's not natural to man but that by nature he has a black or brown skin 
like our forefathers, the Hindus, that consequently a white man has never originally sprung from the womb of nature, and that thus there is no such thing as a white race, as much as this is talked of, but every white man is a faded or a bleached one. Yeah. Uh, and of course, so this is what I'm saying. Uh, it, it, yeah, she, she might be wrong uh, in, the, in that she, she, she didn't do her research properly in that way, but I don't think black people in, in Africa would be uh, we would use we would use uh, Dr. Watson's book and support their prejudice for for minors. That that's just uh, something that you won't see in 2020. Well, here I do want to actually get onto that test because one of the things that I've noticed people use Wellsing's book for is to promote interracial relationships because they believe you know because. Because the, the black man as genetically dominant myth, right? Uh, what it does is that it says, you know what? We could genetically annihilate white folk. But you cannot genetically annihilate white folk. And not just that. White people have historically genetically annihilated uh, non-white populations all over the planet. You know, to the point where you cannot find an indigenous pure Tans Tasmanian. You cannot find an indigenous pure Australian. You cannot find, you, you could hardly find an indigenous pure Native American, you know? Uh, and, and in some parts of Africa, well, not really, but in some parts of Africa, they, 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 or even some parts of America, you will find populations that look like white people who, who are shunned for having black ancestors, but they look like white people. You know? Ronda Rousey, in fact, the, the famous uh, MMA fighter, she is. She has a black ancestor. Same thing with Rock Newman. So Rock Newman is considered African American, but phenotypically he looks like a white man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 the thing is that this is the path. This is the this is the pathway for. This is like the the, the destiny of African Americans, uh, particularly because they are they are the minority in America, and and this is the destiny of them if we. If, especially, particularly, if we're pushing forward this narrative that we have this better biological uh, genetics, and and like in a sense, we we are better uh, genetically, uh, but we but the whole idea that white that we can exterminate white folk while being a minority, and she's even specifying America, the idea that we could annihilate a majority population is is poppycock, and and that's part of the pseudoscience. Yeah, okay, so I, I, I'd like to push this a little further because I, the, the idea, and I had a debate about this uh, maybe three months ago, but the idea that uh, blacks, Africans, especially, and the, Australia, if you're talking about Tasmanians, those people were killed. It's not like white people interbred with the Tasmanians and then the they, they superior white DNA or white, white gene. Uh, uh, survive. No, they kill those people. That that's just facts. They kill uh, every one of them. Basically. No, and wait, Australia, wait. Australia, let me intervene right there. Let me intervene right there. Yeah. There's this movie called Rabbit Proof Fence. So for people who are curious, I mean, I didn't really watch it myself, but it's about them actually deliberately genetically annihilating these uh us, these Tasmanians. Like they deliver, yes. like like they did kill them, but also when you are the minority. You no longer pose a genetic threat. That's the idea. But go on. I got. I got it. Okay. Yeah. So, so I want to chime in. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, uh, Rolla P. She spoke on something I was going to cover. So she said, in Brazil, we have a lot of white people with black ancestors. This line of thought is really an issue. And I was going to speak of that. So my heritage is from South America. You know, of African native descent. There's branches of my family where my great uncle, you would identify him as a black man, but he married a Lebanese woman or a Turkish, Turkish Lebanese. And from then on, they married white every generation. So his grandchildren were phenotypically white with blonde hair and blue eyes at that point. Damn. And this is only two, three generations later. Three generations. That's it. Yeah. If, if you wait, hold on, just just to, just to illust just to clarify, there's also this. There's a famous singer. I don't remember her name, but like a, quite a few famous singers. Or even if you like, if you look at any of these, 
like anybody who's a mulatto, like like an octoroon, if you will, that's somebody who's a an eighth black. They look almost like they look indistinguishable from being black. Like they look almost indistinguishable from being. They look indistinguishable from being white. A lot of times, like I said, Ronda Rousey, you would not expect her. Like you would not suspect her of anything. Mariah Carey, you know, somebody has to tell you. Oh yeah, she's you know she's you know whatever. Uh, and then and Mariah Carey is just uh, as far as I understand, she's technically would just be a mulatto, but of course she's not. It's just that the one drop rule makes it so that you know her father, who might himself be mixed, you know, they we just call him black. So, but 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 Mariah Carey would look just looks like a white woman, you know, who yeah. can sing. But but at the same time, uh, you know, yeah, she she has that thing. So. So the the reality of of the reality of whether or not like the reality is that, that yes you can be genetically annihilated in just three generations it, there's there's no question about that the idea that black people can genetically annihilate white folk I mean you could annihilate black folk, white folk in three generations but the the trouble is that it, it depends on the population so so when when I was talking about I was talking about this uh case in, in Zimbabwe. Where black people are ninety nine point six percent of the population, right? When you're ninety nine point six percent of the population is fourteen million against thirty thousand. Yes, you can definitely genetically annihilate the thirty thousand. When you're talking about in America where there's two hundred million white people and forty million black folk, and and some of those black folk are most of those black folk are mixed, right? <laughs> when you're talking about it like that, no, uh, the 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 white people will genetically uh, annihilate the black folk. No, she was speaking about U.S. A lot of these American speakers are speaking about the oh. U.S. Yeah, but uh, her, her book was not just about the U.S. She was talking about right. the, the, the white race being the minority if you have about. to, in the world, if you have to uh, pick the Indians, the Chinese, the Japanese, the yeah. blacks. Yeah. The, the white the white race and also another thing that would support uh, her idea is that the, the birth rate of, of white people in Europe has been declining for, for some time. Yeah. There has been a peak lately, and I was doing some research research about this uh, and at the peak of, of Corona just to see the differences. But there is there has been a bit of a peak in in, in Europe of, of childbirths, but this is because of the immigration of a lot of. Uh, of people from Turkey and from all these East uh, European places and Africa, of course. Yeah. But generally, the the white race or the white people uh, birth rate has been declining for a long time to a point that mm -hmm. some Scandinavian countries are actually uh, giving uh, the uh, female uh, population incentives to go make babies uh, so that they have. Uh, more people for like for, for work and such. But the thing is, Africans, for example, think this, speaking of Africa as Africa, they, the white race is 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 a minority here in Africa. It's really a minority. Of Even course, we have to. It is a minority compared to black people. Of course. Okay, so, well, so I was going to say, right? So in the previous podcast. On a, an auntie that was speaking about uh, Neely Fully Jr., right? So, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson cites him a lot, and she follows this line of thinking and dividing the world in white and non white. So, a lot of times she's just referring to most of the world is non white, and it's not really zoomed in on African, exactly. right? So, because the world being non white, so if Africans go mix with a bunch of Asians, that's not good for us either, right? Because exactly. Africans will be annihilated through Asians. Right? So, so she doesn't mm. speak on that. She just talks about white and non-white. That's her dichotomy. Yeah. So let, let me actually talk to that, too. So that's the thing. White people and black people are about the same number population-wise. Uh, so and, and the thing is that even if you move to Europe, you will still be genetically annihilated because they're still the majority there. Just like if, if, uh, if, if I, you know, like, like for instance, I could go to Africa and get my my genetic material purified because that's where you would so anybody anybody in the world can go to Africa and get their genetic material transformed into the African uh, genetic material uh, over time but 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 here's the thing you know the difference between Europe, Europe Europe has a smaller birth rate because it has a more stable economy 
you know, and it has a, a, a better life expectancy. Uh, it, you know, it, it has a lower infant mortality rate, you know. So, like, somebody was asking me, was Garvey an only child? And it's like, no, I think he had uh, nine, he had eight siblings, but only two survived, you know, past childhood. You know, so so in certain economies, yes, people will have a lot of children because of a low expectation of, of, of their children uh, staying alive. And, of course, you know, the tradition transforms, but now there's going to be, you know, more children who survive uh, through the time, and then maybe the birth rate will slow down too. But, but, but the idea that you know Africa has uh, Africa right now is about a billion a African people globally. It's about a billion. Uh, white people globally is about a billion. You know, uh, because again, like I said, uh, uh, Europe. I mean, Africa. I mean, America has two hundred million white people. You know, so it's the largest white country in the world, but it's also two hundred million is. Uh, like, uh, I want to say, I can't remember if Nigeria was, how much was Nigeria again? Maybe 200 million too. Yeah, so it's about the size of Nigeria. Nigeria is 200 million. Yeah, so yeah. It's, so it's like they have the same amount of white people as Nigeria has. And Nigeria is the largest country in Africa, but by far though. Uh, what, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah what, what, only only Ethiopia maybe uh, is, is comparable. And then like there's other countries that are like 5 million, 2 million, so on and so forth. But, but the idea, but then of course if you compare the economy of America to Nigeria, you know, it's like, it's like you're not really, you're not really making a real comparison. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like you make, you're making a mistake right there. So, 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 so yes, white people, and, and then of course, you know, when it comes to China though, there's like 1.5 billion Chinese people. There's like 1.3 billion Indian people. India's rapidly growing. China's rapidly growing. If the Chinese, if America, if Africa doesn't get its, its stuff together, the Chinese can send over 500 million people. Okay, because they have a whole bunch of men that that have no partners because they killed off their girls for some reason because they were trying to limit their population growth, and they could send over all those men and they're already doing this already, but they can do that and all these Africans that you think are pure are going to be mixed and erased and Ameri and Africa is going to have a Chinese population in its soil. So so you know what what you know I would say it goes back to power. It doesn't, but the whole idea of, oh, black people can't be genetically annihilated because there's non-whites, we are the minority, we, we are just as numerous as these, uh, as these uh, Europeans, but they have stable economies, and they have, they have laws that can protect them from uh, genetic annihilation, whereas anybody can walk up into Africa right now, and, and, and you're, 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 you're not the same number. And, and, and again, you know, I, I want to illustrate, I want people to understand this too, you know, that if your economy is not good and you have a high population, because this is what this is what the white people are not trying to have. When you have a bad economy and a high population, you will have genocides. You will have theft. You will have killing. You will have uh, revolutions, but but mainly revolutions towards you know just a bunch of slaughter uh, on your own people. So the 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 you know a whole bunch of children is just a whole bunch of child soldiers. You know, a whole bunch of children in a bad economy is a whole bunch of child soldiers, and that's on its way. If we don't, no, that's not true. I mean, if you, if you have to cite from, I mean, from similar books where you're talking about, where you're talking about, uh, if you look at Stephen Pinker, for example, he's talking about almost the same thing. They're talking about that. if the with a stable economy, let people are having less kids or less children. But that, that's not completely true in, in Africa, and uh, I can attest for, for that. But the issue of having more kids, it, 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 that means a lot more child soldiers. A lot of African countries, a lot of African states, and most of them are actually very different. If you have to look at Africa, you, you can't look at it as a monolith. It, it's not the same in South Africa, for example, as it is in, in Namibia or, or Botswana and uh, Angola and the other state. Of course. <clears throat> so, yeah, so uh, th there, is, there is a significant improvement in, uh, in the living conditions in uh, all African countries. Economies, yes, they've been going through their deep. Angola, for example, I can speak for Angola, for example, is that there, there, there was the height, it was the fastest growing economy in the world, even faster than China uh, at some point. And they, they, there was that deepened in 2014 when the oil prices went down. What happened is 
this country, even though the population in this country would like for, for things to go a little, a little bit more or faster in terms of economic growth and, and, and health and everything. But Angola is actually doing quite well. People here are disgruntled, they are not happy about everything locally and everything. But if you look at it from outside, there has been huge uh, improvements. You don't see a country like Angola going into a civil war, but Angola is the second or maybe the second or the third uh, most uh, fertile country in Africa after maybe Niger. But it is, nice. a, a, it is steadily growing, stable economy, even though there, there, there is issues here. So a, a lot of other countries, like Botswana, for example, you see that they have been growing. They have been growing, they have been producing a lot, of, they have been having a lot of children as well. You see the same thing in the media. So it's not, the, the situation, if you read it only from a point of, uh, of an European study, what goes into Africa and, and trying to compare uh, scientific data in Africa with scientific data in Europe and say the Scandinavian countries are having less kids because they have uh, they have a lot more uh, stable economy. You can't compare it to Angola. You can't compare it to Botswana. Well, the dynamics are totally different. I, I when I when I when I, I just want to clarify when I said the child soldiers part, I was talking about when you have food scarcity. Okay, so th there's a uh, there's this there's just normal. There's just this normal expectation that everybody can eat, but if if eventually you have more mouths than can be fed, then you know, it's, or more mouths than can be fed and more mouths than can be employed, you know, through honest work, right? You know, honest work as by you know a good economy, then you will find people who will try to be fed through dishonest work, and eventually you'll find children who want to be fed. No, I'm not saying right now. I'm just saying that, you know, you know, the projection for population growth, eventually if you do not have a have a have a have if eventually food scarcity can come about if your population is way more high than can be produced or than than is produced. But I'm not saying right now. I'm just saying in the distant future or not the distant future, near future or distant future. The the point being that if 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 a country does not get to get get, get it together, then, then you will find that war is the way that humans solve the problems of, of poor economies. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but you, you, so, so what I'm saying is in counter, countering that point is that African economies, African countries, whatever people believe is, uh, the truth is things are actually going in the right direction. I wouldn't say I am, I am, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I would right now like for all these old uh, leaders, uh, African leaders from the the, the struggle, the, the independence struggle. I would like for all of them to go to a senior house and just sit there and live out their lives uh, and, and be happy to put in young people that work. But the, the truth is there is actually there is actually some progress being made. The point about the scarcity, for example, uh, Africa itself, if, if we are, if there, there is studies are just I have to come back on this, but there is studies that even if we double or triple in, in the population, Africa itself could feed itself without having any help. So your point is taken that there yeah. has to be some kind of stability. Yeah. It's not as fast as we would like to would like it to, to come to come back. The economy is of course we, we what I'm saying is we are learning. There there are things like for example in Angola uh, the reality that I live here. Uh, with the people I work with, the reason discuss the food, food for example, is the cheapest here yeah, than anywhere else that I have been, cheaper than South Africa, maybe even cheaper than the US. Food is cheap, food is, uh, but the thing is, the connection lines, you don't have transport to get it from one place to another. Yeah. Botswana produces this whole meat that almost 20% uh, of Africa, yeah. and it can feed all of Africa. So I'm saying, Scarcity and all those things, those are just, uh, if you're not in the ground, you won't really understand what I'm trying to say. But the thing is, there is some kind of stable growth. Mm. And I think, I don't know if you're a proponent of limiting the number of children that one should have, but I, I, think, okay. uh, I, think, I think production of more kids is essential. And China is finding it hard now. They're trying to uh, get people to have more children. They've, 
cut down their yeah. one child policy now. All but right. You see, projections say that there won't be more people more. Yeah. Okay. Oh uh, wait. Oh, hold on a second. Hey, Sani. Hey, Sani. Can you hear us? Or not really. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Finally. Okay. Yeah. So so, hey, Sani, you wanna you wanna introduce yourself quickly before Afro Native says something? Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Isani. <laughs> I'm not sure what type of information y'all want from me. <laughs> okay. Well, how, what do you think about the book? What do I think about the book? Yeah. Sure. Okay, um, so I've been listening since about, it's, I'm on Central Time, so 10, 15, 11, 15 Eastern. Um, I do agree with most of what's been stated in terms of um, the book being based on her theories that seem to be adopted from um, her mentor, Neely Fuller Jr., about um, genetic annihilation of um, European people. Um, that's not what I focused on when I read the book. Um, Every time I read the book, I kind of focused on more of her um, psychological um, theories, which I have found some basis for in society. I kind of, when I read, I pretty much discard what I don't feel is accurate or relevant. And in that case, it was the, um, what you guys are stating is pseudoscience mm -hmm. um, in terms of genetics, when she went into that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there are genetic differences between Europeans and Africans and Asian. Um, I do have certain beliefs based on theories that I've come across in my own research about uh, European genetics, uh, but I'm not going to go into that now. But my whole thing with the ISIS papers is that I think from just the standpoint of psychology, I think that she's pretty much on point with a lot of the things um, she stated in. Okay, well, thank you so much. Afro Native, what were you going to say? Yeah, yeah, appreciate the words, Sonny Drop. I agree. Uh, I was going to mention, so since you all were talking about the number of children you all should have and all that, so Dr. Francis Chris Wilson actually provided guidance, advice, recommendations on that. Oh, yeah, true. And I posted this on Twitter, and I want to see what you all think. So she said, a man should not have a child until he's 35. A woman shouldn't have a child until he's 30, and they shouldn't have more than two children. And she talked about African people, black people, shouldn't have more than two children. You know, man, no more than, like, you know, wait until you're 35. Exactly. Wait until she's 30. Mm -hmm. What do y'all think about yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, no, someone else, go ahead. <laughs> no, you, you, you say that because you was, you was, you you thought I was saying that, <laughs> so now that now that Francis said it, what she what no. you said? Yeah, I, I just want I want I want you guys to know, like I suddenly said, and I, I completely agree. There are things in that book that I don't agree with. Uh -huh. So that, for example, I've heard I've heard her speak about it. Uh, I watched a video a while back, which was speaking about that people should have kids, and there was a brother in the, in the audience who actually said there was positives coming out. of that theory in, in North Korea, and I, I don't know much about North Korea, but I wouldn't take any any example of good examples from there mm -hmm. uh, so far because I haven't been there. I don't know anything about it. Exactly, Ho Chi Minh. No, Ho Chi Minh. Kim Jong Un, right? <laughs> Kim Jong Un. Practice. They they put that theory in, 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 in practice, having kids only after a certain age. I don't agree with that. But my my idea is that Africans. In general, uh, black people in, in, in the world would be to have more kids, just make more kids as you can. Mm -hmm. what, 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 the, the issues of economy and how it will play into the into feeding people, there are people working on those things and, and, and that, can, that have theories that can back up the idea that uh, um, there is enough for everyone to, to eat and live off. But, he, like inside he said, yes. I don't agree with everything in that book. Mm -hmm. In that book, no, I'm not gonna take it as my Bible and, and live according to it. Yes, I'll take what's good out of that book, and that's that, that's just with any other book that I read. Yeah, so I want to actually chip in on here too. So my thing is this: when I read that, I was like, does this woman not know about initiations? Is this woman not mm -hmm. leaving? Is she not leaving America? Like in America, yes, you want to. You're not necessarily socially ready. Uh, for a relationship before a certain age, I could say that, sure. 
but a lot to a large extent that has to do with the American economy and it has nothing to do with the African experience it has nothing to do with Africa you know uh, you know as the brother was saying now I'm not necessarily gonna say that we should we should overproduce but I don't really have any problem with that and I understand that people in Africa you know want to do that uh, me personally, I think I'm over it, kids, but <laughs> for now, uh, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying, like, after you have a child, you know, uh, you know, uh, punch you, you're just like, you know what, forget it, um, but, <laughs> no, I'm joking, um, but, but, like, on the real, uh, like, like, uh, her whole thing is completely based off, like, I, the thing that I have with a lot of these American speakers, right, is that they're almost entirely inside of America, and they have nothing to do, like, it has nothing to do with Africa. This has nothing, this is like child psychiatry in America, where people are so removed from their African experience, from their African roots. Whereas, if you were in Africa, you could have a child, I mean, I don't want to say the number, because you guys are going to be like, Matt might be too young, so let's just say, let's say 18, right? But, you know, even younger than 18, yeah, yeah. you would have an initiation, right? And you and somebody else your age. I would I would recommend somebody your age, but you and somebody else your age can, if the economy is right, if there are jobs ready, you guys can move into the same apartment or whatever you you know. In in traditional times, you might call it a hut, you know. In in modern times, it might be an apartment. You move in together, you create a life, and and, and uh, sorry, you create a life in a community, so that you'll have communal living, communal spaces. You'll have you know everybody, all the women or all the all the. All the people who are willing to are watching the children, uh, all of them making sure the children are safe and, and growing. There's no like the, 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 the model of the model of of oh you gotta wait until you're this amount of age, that's already a failed model. You know? The the the, the, the couple raising a, a a child is already a failed model. You know, you, you two people, just two people raising a child or even a group of children is is not go, is not is not going to work for you as an African, and it doesn't work for white people. You know. Yeah. So 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 like if her theory is based off of that, it's already like nah. I would I would I, like 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 this is like a high discretion for me. It's highly discretionary. If I'm you know I, unfortunately I didn't read the book until my son was born. So uh so I read it five years ago, and I read it to him. You know, while he was uh, a baby, I thought her giving that warning about you know having children was a good idea. You know, was a good idea at the time. I mean, I, I thought it was a good idea in so far as nobody else is really talking about it. You know, nobody nobody else was really talking about family planning, as far as I'm concerned. But but it's not. But even when I read it back then, I was like, this has more to do with Western family planning. It has nothing to do with African family planning. You know. What, 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 yeah. I, I just want to say this, what I would want for us as a black family is for us to focus on creating an African uh, community, African living space, so that, you know, the, the, the issue of, you know, two, two, two people, two, two young people having children is inconsequential, as opposed to now where it's like you have to be an elderly, you know, you have to be older and financially stable. No, you need a community that is financially stable right. that has yeah. elders. That that's what you need. And, and I'll just just yeah. say this point. Let me just say this point. Sorry, I, I know I'm hogging it uh, on my own program. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But uh, I want to say this. At one point, I was uh, I was on this. I was on the. Uh, you know, I used to like try to recruit people on the street to come to my uh, meetings and stuff. You know, like organization stuff, right? And uh, one of the people. And sorry, I don't know if I just unplugged my uh, mic. Can you guys hear me? We can, we can. Okay, yeah. One of these people, they, uh, I, I told them, I said, uh, you should, I said, uh, uh, if you have, if you have children, uh, you know, who's gonna watch them, blah, 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 and then, and then this woman was like, oh, I don't know, and I was like, don't you have a brother? And she was like, what's my brother have to do with anything? You know? Oh, like, if you have a son, who's gonna teach him manhood? And she was like, I don't know, you know, blah, 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 and I was like, don't you have a brother? And she was like, what's my brother do anything? And the idea is that even in traditional, like, like, early... African Americans, like before modern time, African Americans would have a system called maternal uncles. You know, so even so on the continent, we have maternal uncles who would teach our children, uh, our children, uh, you know, manhood, right? 
And then on the yeah. even in America, you know, back in the day, you'd have that. And the same with regards to like like other stories, like uh, like 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 for instance, when my mother was growing up, she would hear uh, uh, Nazi stories, you know. But then when when and this was in Jamaica, but then when she's come here, you know, the Westernized American experience, she doesn't she doesn't tell us those stories, you know. So it's like a lot of the erosion of the culture is what's going on. And, and what we would have to do, what we have to focus on is that the, the troubles of the West really got nothing to do with what we, like, it's not a solve, it's not a solution thing that we could do uh, moving forward. And sorry, I'm hogging up the time because I know we only have an hour of much. So, so yeah, anybody else want to say anything? And, and also, I didn't realize the comments were going on, so I'm going to say, hey to Jam and KW Don and Parola P. All right. But all right, go on. Sorry. Yeah, yeah to, the, to your point, only uh Jessica Jam Abu Yor, she just stated in Georgia and South Carolina, Africans would be away in until 30s to have children as incomprehensible. Our elders had seven to ten children each and still look at it as funny when we don't produce. <laughs> oh, Jam said that. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, anybody else have any, anything else to say about. I, I wanted yeah. to actually jump into. If, if, unless you guys want to ju jump into something else, let me know. No, I mean, yeah, I, I think. For me, for example, yeah, I, I, there's so much I can say about the, the differences between the, the, the American, black American uh, experience and the African experience. Not African experience only, but the diverse, the diversity in the African experience is huge. It's big. Like if you guys start thinking about Africa, if you think about about it really, well, there is common things like communal living and such things, but. Some cultures in, in the northern Africa, in the west, and the east Africa are totally, totally different. But there is a lot of those commonality things like our, our communal living and such things and such things. But yeah, I mean, there is maybe this is a topic we can expand on another day. But yeah, but I think the, the basis of our, our podcast here is, uh, is the ISIS papers. And, and then you had some issues with not just the. the Having come, you know, about children. <laughs> and what else in that book you thought uh, is pseudoscience? Uh, 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 well, uh, okay. I was going to say, uh, I mean, I can cover some good things you said, you know, because I'm balanced. You know, I'm going to pick out good Nah, good nah, nah, go to the bad. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I'm balancing out. I, mean, we all, I think we all know it's a, it's, it's a, like, like you. I, I want to say this. Patahotep says that you can learn from anybody. You know, you can learn from anybody. So it's not a question of whether there is there is any... Like, it's not a question of... and There's no such thing as a book that's all bad. You know, I could pick up Plato and find something good. You know what I mean? Like, you could, you could pick up... You could pick up, you know, freaking Mein Kampf and find something good. You know, but, but the idea is that, you know... The idea is that this is an esteemed classic. And, and how much, truly how much of it is suicide. But yeah, tell us something good though. Because some people, somebody did say, uh, Jack said that he wanted to read it. So to tell him why he should read it, I guess. Should I tell me? <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, Afro Native, since he's a hater. I mean, I mean oh, since okay. he's critical. <laughs> since he's he a hater, no, I mean critical. <laughs> Alright, so, so she makes an excellent point on something that's very controversial. So in the Pan-African space, there's a lot of our brothers and sisters that adhere to Marxism, mm -hmm. right? And I've had ongoing debates and arguments with folks on Twitter that are, you know, they are self-identified Pan-Africanists and Black nationalists, and they defend Cuba and they defend Fidel Castro, and they want to talk about there ain't no racism in Cuba. There's racism in Cuba. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So this is important. So on page 188. She talks about capitalism and communism. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to read this. Wait, give, give me two seconds to... That capitalism, okay. Was that? Uh, I said give me two seconds to pull it up on the, uh, on okay. the screen. Let me see if I yeah, can. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, no, right, you can start reading. I'll just pull it up later, I guess. You said 188? Yeah, page 188. Okay. I got the actual physical copy, so I'm not sure what it is in the PDF. No, it's the same, it's the same book. It's just... Uh, it's just that they uh they they put two pages on a at a time so okay yeah 188 all right let me just put the screen up hold on a second all right yeah go on yeah start reading all right 
So the critical question for black people is, who is the real enemy? While massive numbers of black males are unemployed and increasing, numbers are being shot down in the streets in a presumably capitalist country, the same capitalist country is helping white communist countries and their workers return to their jobs and have sufficient meats and other foods on their tables. Basically, the U.S. supporting the U.S. is supporting the whole white so-called communist bloc. This does not include the Chinese-speaking non-white peoples. What is starkly illustrated here is that capitalism and communism, so both of them are in quotation marks, are not two enemies, but simply the two extreme ends of a total spectrum of economic practices under the system of white supremacy, wherein it is the priority that all whites, male in particular, have jobs whether they are at the right of left economic ends of the white supremacy spectrum, at the right or left economic ends of the white supremacy spectrum. The same would be true of the Democratic Party or Republican Party political spectrum, which in this area of the world is this total political spectrum of politics under white supremacy. So, that... that well, go, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. Also, it must be... Okay, so... I was reading what I highlighted, but I'll read that for you. So, also, it must be noted that while black males are being shot down in increasing numbers and experiencing high unemployment, white Cuban communists in mass numbers are being admitted to find their places, jobs, and housing in this capitalist country and are referred to as political refugees. Black Haitians, however, had not are not admitted and treated similarly. Okay. And, and yeah, I can definitely speak on that for a long time being from Miami. So. <laughs> All right, boss. Yeah, what were you gonna say about that? Bro, what were you gonna yeah, say about that? Somebody. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, you the one read it. Yeah. <laughs> why'd you Why'd you read it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as I was saying, um, within the Pan African space, there's a lot of folks that adhere to Marxism, right? Mm -hmm. And they constantly use Kwame Ture's quote that uh, Fidel Castro was the greatest Pan Africans and all of that. Dang. I'm like, how is that possible when black people in Cuba are still suffer? You know what I mean? Like, there's been black political prisoners. Black people and white people in Cuba are not equal. So I cannot believe that is always repeated over and over again. Yeah. Well, what's that? Was very, I what? think people ain't seen because the current president of Cuba is a white man. Mm -hmm. We have never seen no black Cuban president, right? Unless you want to call Batista, you know what I mean, mixed race. But since Fidel Castro, and there's there's been, even when I present evidence from black Cuban scholars that have spoken about it, they still say, oh, that's, that's capitalists. No, they capitalists. No, they anti-communists. So Dr. Francis Crest Wilson is making a great point that whether capitalists or communists is still part of the white supremacy system. Well, I mean, yeah, but I, I, I don't see why she talks. She's not really talking about uh, uh, Cuba here, though. She's just she's just saying in general. I I think you know honestly though, if I were if I were like if when I read the, when if I read this the first time, I might be like, yeah, that's pretty cool. But if I were reading this today, I might say, you know, this is just uh this is like like you know just a misrepresentation of 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 like the system, the capitalist, the U.S. supporting. Uh, the communist bloc, like we should probably really understand this. The U.S. supporting the communist bloc has uh, nothing. Like it's not really what it sounds like. It's it's the U.S. is doing what is called geopolitics. Like we are the only people who believe that the U.S. should not support other countries, you know. But the U.S. is doing what the U.S. is doing because that's part of being autonomous and being in in power and in control. And and yes, it, it like 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 honestly, these are just a different nation and engaging in other nations does not mean that you're supporting the other nation. You know? So so African people like for instance, African countries did in fact trade with European countries. But that doesn't mean that African countries supported European countries or European countries supported African countries. And even to this day we have African countries and European countries trading. So it's not it's 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 really like like, like, like like we are buying into the propaganda that the US uses to motivate its own people to get to, you know this motivate its underclass to get into war but once you stop doing that you realize that you know this simplification like 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 you know I'm not no show I mean of course you know if the other brother was here he told me on the show but like the Democratic Republican Party they they are working together because they literally go to work together you know what I mean they literally work in the same building it doesn't necessarily mean that they're like legit, like they're not oppositional parties. It's just that they are literally 
working together because they literally have to work together. They're literally co-workers. So, if, so you know, a lot of times what, what, what you know, American simplifications will be is that, you know, or like, like you'll see an image of, of Obama hanging out with Bush or something. Or you'll see, or you'll just see a Republican politician hanging out with a, a Democratic politician. And it's like, yeah, they're co-workers. You know, they can have ideological differences. And of course, and my thing is that, you know, white supremacy is a simplification in so much as, and this, this is another thing I don't like about Nelly Fuller Jr. It's a simplification in the sense that if you, it's a, it's a white government, it's a white country. You're not going to have white people in a country that are not about white people. You know, and I, I want to actually just just to pull it back to this. Like the sister the other day, I was telling her, you know, it's really about the elites, right? And she was like, no, it's not really about the elites because I guarantee you, she said it, I guarantee you that if black folk were to get up and do an uprising, that white people would fight against us. And I was like, yeah, because that's self-defense. You understand? Like, 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 yeah, white people are going to defend white people because if you are attacking white people, then you are attacking them. You know, if you are attacking America, you are attacking the white man's government. You know, if I go to Nigeria and I start attacking the Nigerian government, right, unless people in Nigeria really didn't like the Nigerian government, they would fight against me, notwithstanding, notwithstanding, uh, you know, how they feel about Nigeria, unless they really, really hated it, only because, you know, you as a foreigner or as another population, another person, and I'd be a foreigner in Nigeria, right, but you as a foreigner or whatever, if you're attacking the, the government and the whole infrastructure of a nation, yes, the people are going to be against you. You know, and it's not, I wouldn't say it's a global system of white supremacy as much as it is a system where white people have to govern themselves and they set up a system to govern themselves. And if you as a black minority is attacking the system that they have in place to govern themselves, so that you can govern over them. No, they're gonna freaking kick you out of there. Like, like there's no, there's no reason for them to agree to that. Yeah, I'd just like to say that that, that happened in, in Libya, and the people actually supported uh, the USA. So, and, and it just is a segue from what you were saying. That you you say. So, what I, my question actually I have to ask. So, the idea that uh, there is an you know, uh, there's a, a um, a joint force of white suprem supremacists from all over the globe uh, trying to undermine the black uh, the black race is is that is that not something that you you think you can give credit uh, to especially from the book because she's trying what I what I got from this book and I would like to say again I don't take much from the spiritual and all those things but what you get from the book and from our side. And I guess from the black American living in the USA, you can feel that there is a force against whatever uh, progress that your co community is trying to make, right? Take examples like uh, uh, the communities that black people organize and the white people try to destroy. Take examples of Tulsa, for example. Sorry, you cut out. You cut out. No more is it? Yeah, did I cut off? Yeah, a little bit. You, but go on, what are you saying? Yeah, so I was saying, like, don't you believe that there is an external force of white super supremacy that is trying to basically put down the black race? You don't believe that? In geopolitics. In ge I would say in geopolitics. I think it's a geopolitical system, and I think that America is the dominant power. So America does try to put down its indigenous black population. And by extension, it would have to put down other black populations because, because if there are strong black populations in the world, it will make their indigenous, well not indigenous, I shouldn't say indigenous, but it will make their black population that much stronger proportionally. So exactly. in, in that sense, the, the, the quote unquote white supremacy, like, like the reason why the, it's the Americans who are talking about white supremacy is because it's America, the white American who is doing this sort of uh, racial paradigm, uh, like this, this sort of black oppression. And it's not just the white American, because again, you could look at Haiti, and you could look at what, uh, what uh, what's his name said about Haiti. Um, 
what's the guy's name? Uh, oh, Napoleon. He said that the reason why they invaded Haiti was to forever stop the march of black people. And, and of course, th he, he would say that at the time because it was very important to realize that the march of black people was something nearly inevitable uh, in regards to uh, that situation, that point in time. But, yeah, they, but basically what you have is that America has allies around the world and America has interest, economic interest around the world. And, and a part of that, and a part of, and, and of course, Africa is not only weak, but Africa has a lot of resources that the Western world would be interested in. Uh, but again, it would be a geopolitical uh, paradigm. And, and the reality being that any weak people are subject to uh, uh, oppression. And, and the thing with black people, unfortunately, is that we do not organize to not be weak people. You know, Chinese organize to be uh, to not be weak people, so the Chinese can sit at the table. The Japanese organize to not 12. be. In chapter twelve, one uh, page one five three, and, and she she lays out what we're talking about here because we have to re recognize what you're saying, like All weak right. people. I wouldn't say weak people, but we have to first of all recognize it. But then we have to have two types of thinking. You, have, you either have the circular thought. You said one five three. Okay, hold on. one five three. I got flu, so my voice will be coming out straight. Because, uh, yeah, so um, sorry about that. Circular, it's either you have circular thought, which means that you're moving from problem perception away from problem solution down the diversionary path. Because some people in the US, for example, would just say, okay, it's just a white people, black people, and two different white people working in the same building and they're working together. Then they, they have nothing actually plotting against black people. Whilst history has taught us that they've done this for a long time, both uh, Democrats and, uh, and uh, Republicans, right? So some people would say, okay, this is just white people. You're going down a diversionary path, uh, as Dr. Wilson say, says, it, says it here. You know there is a problem, you whine about it, you say, okay, we, we are with people and everything, but, but then you, at the end, you almost like deny it. It's like, okay, this is just the normal of the world. And, and, and whilst we black people should be moving to more linear uh, thoughts, like she's put it here, that we've recognized that we have, we have been weak. We have let these people put us under the oppression for a long time. Now we move towards uh, dismantling this white supremacy uh, system. Yeah. Well, I mean, look. I, I want to say the thing. The trouble with this is that, you know, like like the the uh, the problem is like, what are your expectations? You know, do you expect two like a one one white political party and another white political party to not be pro white? No, oh, I, I expect black people uh, to um, to to organize themselves. I mean, uh, Doctor, what, what's his name? Uh, the, what's it, I forgot his name. I, I, I expect black people in, in the U.S. And, and I guess a lot of Pan-Africanists from the U.S. have actually tried to do this as well. They've tried to get the back the backing of African nations in terms of power, real power, uh, or military power, and such things, or even uh, uh, power in the organizations that these African nations belong to, to put pressure in the U.S. on the U.S so that they can uh, get rid of certain laws in, in, uh, in America, in the U.S., you know. So the, the power that we have to seek amongst us, black people, and that's irrespective of whether you are in the U.S. or in Africa or in the Trinidad or whatever, mm -hmm. is to seek help from each other. And I think that's, the, that's what the, the book, what's the essence of the book, what I get from the book is that She's trying to tell us, no matter how you read it, if you read it that she, she's wrong about the symbolism and about this spirituality, about <laughs> the, I'm about the science, yeah. what, what do we get from it? I, I mean, uh, maybe uh, like you can tell me, apart from what you cited there about Marxist, but else, what do you think there is positives that we can get from this book that can 
spur us on to, to organize further organize better. Well, all right. Well, let me let me actually just touch on this thing. Cause I really want to touch on this because I think it's I think some of this stuff is the most ridiculous parts of the book. I know you want me to say something positive, but I think people who are unfamiliar with the book, you know, don't just want to hear something positive because then they might you know think that they actually like like there are certain things that need to be addressed so here's this one part it's on page 62 to 63 where she draws an image of male genitalia and then says that right there is the cross you know uh and the cross is really just male genitalia and testicles uh that is just nonsense and and of course she says it represents the white man's you know penis and blah 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 or the black male's body uh, meaning castrated genitals, thus the cross is a critical symbol in the thought process of white supremacy system. Beginning its evolution almost 2,000 years ago during early white aggression against blacks in Africa and Asia. This particular interpretation of the cross never has been suggest given before. And it's like, yeah, it's never been given before because it's nonsense. She goes on, you know, oh yeah. And then here's the thing I don't like about a lot of things with black people. And the, the thing is that a lot of this is encouraging conspiracy theory and, of course, encouraging you know, us analyzing films. There's this famous uh, black guy, uh, or this famous conscious speaker, uh, who just analyzes films all the time. You know, it's like, oh, you gotta watch The Matrix, because The Matrix tells you, and it's like, no, I don't need to watch yeah. these stupid films. But here's, interestingly, mm -hmm. following The Exorcist, so she talks about the movie The Exorcist uh, in pretty graphic detail. Oh yeah, here the female is used to masturbate herself when she was possessed by the devil, i.e. the black monster, and it's like, what? And I'm, I'm here reading this to my son. I'm like reading this to my infant son. You know? <laughs> like, like what, am I, what am I reading to this kid? Right? Uh, white females being sexually aggressing against... Like, a lot of this is just reading it, reading too much into nothing. You know? Uh, I don't even know. I never watched The Exorcist. I don't even know if the monster is black. But she just made it so. Uh, and she says, King Kong being a major focus of attention. The entire movie suggests an impending sexual attack on the white female by a gigantic black ape now that one actually might be a little bit true but even so it's uh like it's like it's ridiculous then she goes to the nazi movement she goes to the swastika and she says uh right here more recently the fury of the white supremacy dynamic was expressed in the form of nazism and the black swastika and how the uh you know da la la da but you see the thing with this is that the swastika is an ancient african symbol so she's here ranting and raving against this ancient african system and saying that somehow it represents the cross and somehow it represents the white male penis. And it's like, no. You know, like, like none of this, like, this is, like, uh, unfortunately, to me, it's like if I were, like, if you were, you know, puff, puff, pass. I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful, but you understand what I'm saying. It's like, it's just a little bit, a lot of it is just like, if somebody else were saying it. Like, a lot of times, if somebody else were saying this stuff, we would say, you know, get out of here. You know, like, like, like sometimes I, I sit by these, these, these like, occasionally I, I, I go to this brother and he would say, no, I would sit down and then some brothers, like, posing as elders, would say something like, you know, Donald Trump is the 45th president, and you know, 45 in numerology is really 7, and 7 means, you know, and it's like, shut the, f like, shut, <laughs> like, like, shut up, you know, like, like, but, but that's what this reads as. Another image that she had was, oh, the male genitalia, you redraw, this is on page... Uh, well, I didn't say the page number, but let me see. It's on page 108. So on page 108, she draws a male genitalia again. Then she says, here's what it looks like from the side view. This is what it looks like erect. And do you see the magnum? Do you see the gun? And you're like, no, there's no, <laughs> like, what? And she's like, this, this black, <laughs> this black gun, you know, the reason why the white man makes black gun. And you're like, no, freaking cannons were black. You know, they were black, and the people who made the cannons, that's what I, because some other brother was telling me, he was like, oh, you can't mess with friends with Chris Rowling. I'm like, look, the reason why, the, the, the cannons used to be black, and if you know where the cannons are from, the cannons are from the Moors, okay? So the Moors, like, like apparently all the castles in Europe were built by uh, the Moors, who were like African and or Arabs, or a mixture. Like, so they were like people who came into, uh, uh, southern Europe and co and like dominated for like 700 years uh, enslaving white folk no less right and they had cannons to defend their uh, the, their, their, their castles and they were black cannons you know so the idea that the white man makes black guns because he's trying to show the white the black man's penis and that the bullets are sperms 
containing in the like like what are you talking about and then she goes and says well that's why the white man makes the rocket white and then she also goes a whole bunch of sports analogies it's just like a lot of it is like a waste of time and it's a lot of it is just nonsense oh here there's no accident the white male often refers to one another as a son of a gun like this is is unfortunate because this this is I believe like when I when I first opened the book I was like this woman is like I expect this I expected this book to be like on a genius level you know she was trying to do yeah, that, yeah, that was, yeah that was my impression too only because you know you hear all this great talk about the book so I was like man I got to get through the the beginning part of the book because I was like there's so much stuff in here it's like it's hard to take serious but I'm like let me just read the whole thing because they keep saying how good it is. Mm-hmm. But like another example, like chapter ten, ball games as symbols, the war of the balls. Yeah. I mean, this one right here is it's harder. It's harder like not laugh at this. And then chapter eleven, the symbolism of smoking objects. So like chapter ten and eleven, I would skip really, and I would go to chapter twelve where, uh, where Kush was, you know, he had he had cited chapter twelve. But some of these chapters, I feel like you can go ahead and skip them. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of this. I, a lot of this is unfortunately like on the ridiculous and the uh, on the ridiculous and on the uh, not really like it's it's not it's like like she should have left it out like like they, they are interesting essays to be sure but a lot of this is not really picking up on like like, like if you go into the Washington Monument and I'm not going to say that the Washington Monument isn't a phallus at least white people tend to read it as a phallus and a lot of black people do read it as a phallus but it's based off of a Tekken uh, the Tekken being the ancient African uh, uh, structure and what happened in American like if you know American history you know that the uh, early Americans were emulating ancient Kemet so that's why even on the money to this day you will find a pyramid in the background you know, but but the idea is that you know George Washington and Jefferson, they both and a, a lot of them have uh, you know Tekkens, you know, or what, what what white people call obelisks in their uh, like on around their graves, and not just that, like and what what it, what happened too is that a lot of these obelisks, if you will, were actually stolen from ancient Egypt. Well, not not the Washington Monument, but there's one here in Central Park in New York that was, as far as I understand, it was stolen from uh, ancient Egypt, uh, if not crafted here. But but regardless, you know, a lot of what the early Americans were doing, or the early white Americans were, was looking at ancient Egypt and trying to copy that, uh, that you know, super successful government, you know? And that that's actually, uh, if you want to, if you people want a little more insight, that's why the flag in America and, and, and France and England and all that, that's why the flag is red, white, and blue. Because apparently the flag in ancient Egypt, uh, like at least some of the, or at least one of the flags, was red, white, and blue. So, so you know, her reading into this, and and of course, you know, if I want to just go about the Tekken again, uh, uh, that might have been built or architect, you know, art, the architecture behind that might have been uh, that brother from the Dogon uh, tradition. Uh, but I don't remember his, his name escapes me, but there was this brother. Uh, who was like a, a polymath and an architect and all that, you know, during that time. And, and he's the one who, who really designed and organized uh, Washington, D.C. So, so this whole idea of reading it as, you know, this white man's penis, which it could be because, you know, apparently it might have been a phallus <laughs> in ancient Egypt as well. But, but you know, a large, to a large extent, it was more emulation of this great black nation uh, as opposed to you know something that we have to look at and criticize white folk for, you know it's 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 more so this is something that black people had, you know once upon a time, and and a black man might have designed it. I, I don't remember his name for some reason, but he's the one who made the uh, astro. Like anybody remember his name? The, the one who does the astronomy. Uh, yeah, you're talking about Benjamin Banneker. Yeah, Benjamin Banneker. Yeah, he's the one who designed Washington D.C. Yeah, yeah, or at least that's what I heard. Uh, anyway, sorry. So, anybody else have anything uh, about this book? Because again, I, I know. I mean, so, I, let me ask you a question to the panel. Okay. Because what I've gathered from just years of speaking with individuals, attending lectures, watching these different documentaries, and then going back around and speaking with individuals, it seems like a lot of these so-called 
conscious community internalizes uh, what we're calling pseudoscience for the purpose of this conversation, do you feel, or anybody can jump in, do you feel like that is part of the basis for the lack of our ability to progress um, when it comes to our collective goals? Uh, politically, socially, economically, because people are internalizing these theories and instead of having practical application for things that they can actually act on, they're just gathering this information and just sitting with it. Because I feel as though like if people will focus on her psychological analyses, um, like a good one is um, the, the feminization of the black male population. I think that's a really good one from her. Mm. I feel like if we will focus more on that part of her as a part, as opposed to this other stuff, I think we'd be making more ground. Yes, no, maybe so. Yes. <laughs> oh, you. Uh, let, um, let me just go in there. Uh, Sandy, you, you, you. This is what I've been trying to say, like from the beginning. Like, if you read this book from a perspective of it being a perfect book and you, you you can't you can't go live your life according to this book only. Some of the things she's actually said which are maybe correct are outdated in the US and don't make sense here in Africa. If you if you have to if you have to read it to your child or you have to show it to your child, you have to be able to discern it and say, okay, our sister here is trying to wake up this, this is what I get from this book, that this is the trying to wake up every black person out there so that they understand that there is a war, there is a war, it, it, it is psychological, some of the symbols that she's used, she's wrong about, but there is a lot of them that we see, especially if you know you watch uh, Netflix and you, you've seen uh, Disney+, Plus, especially the Disney movies and all, all, all those things, you've seen uh, what the sister uh, is and just said that a uh, feminization of the black man, especially the black man. So all, all I get from this book is that she's trying to alert us to a war that we might not be, uh, uh, we might not be um, aware of. But then you need teachers, you need people in the community that can say, okay, you like a, a father would do, and say, okay, if you read this part. And that's not actually uh, correct. I can point you to a, something that is more practical. We need to absorb as much information as, as we can from all our scholars and then streamline those ideas, those, those information in the current world for us to make it practical. I think, I guess that's what I can say about that. So, yeah, I want to respond to that as well. So, the problem is like, when you look at the book in its entirety, you can really cut half of the book out. And it's unfortunate a lot of these two scientific theories that were presented are in the beginning of the book. So what's going to keep the interest of people that we're trying to wake up? What's going to keep the interest? They're going to laugh at this, right? Most of the best information is towards the end of the book. They don't even get to that part of it. There's people that will read only a few pages and see that, and they're going to laugh at her. And stop reading the book. Yeah, and and that's another thing too. It would make the it 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 makes the community a bit of a joke, you know. Because unfortunately, you know, you're you're going to like I said, you're going to find uh, diamonds in the in the in the in the mill, you know. You, but a problem is you know signal versus noise, you know. And unfortunately, what how she presents the book is that it's a lot of noise. It's a lot of noise. And and yes, it does take away from the value of the book and 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 the and the whole community at large, in so much as uh, yeah, in so much as you know these kind of conspiracies, they 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 just you can't you 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 shouldn't if you're if if you're if you're doing this kind of stuff for the community, you want to curate it, you want to curate your message so that it does not come out this way. You know, this is like a a, a, a fair warning, and, and and because what the trouble is that even though a Sani or a Kush may take away the good parts, a lot of people are going to take away the bad parts and ignore the good parts. You know, and 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 because they're going to take away the bad parts and ignore the good parts, what it does for the communities is it has that confusion. It has because most people, for instance, I want to say this before, because uh, I, I guess a Sani wants to say something. 
I want to say this before anything is that what 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 black people the takeaway from the main takeaway from this book is that white people fear genetic annihilation and that's why that what motivates them a lot and that's why you see all this sort of stuff white people do not fear genetic annihilation at all like like the main takeaway is entirely false and if you work from that premise you like everything is everything is going to be broken but but that's the main takeaway so from that i would say no this, this is just like like there's other ways to say that the white man is feminizing you and how i would say it is that the white man is uh feminine you know what i mean like he he he, he does like he does have a feminine way about him uh but but i would not i would not otherwise uh say that sis you have your mic muted muted if you if that's what you're worried about Hey, Sonny? Let me see if I could. Yes, I'm here. My, um, my sound went away for a minute. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, what, were you going to say something? No, I was just saying that those were all good points. Oh, all right. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> right, like, all right. Well, it looks like Kush is going to say otherwise. Kush, what are you going to say? I agree with uh, what you said earlier in, in the beginning of your last statement is that we you need to curate uh, what what we present to the people. I'm not so much worried about. I mean, who am I worried about if my sister or sister Watson, Dr. Watson, say something? I'm not worried about what other communities uh, how they look at us because there's so much more we can take. Uh, from our scholars. I mean, there is no perfect scholar uh, in in every every uh, every section. So w what we can take from this book is the, the well, what the good thing that she is uh, put us uh, aware of. You know that there is a, a psychological war, obviously, and yes. There might be, like you say, there might not be that the white man is uh, is is, uh, is scared that they are going to go extinct, extinct or something. But there is uh, evidence that that points to the fact that the white man is scared of the black man, and we've seen this with uh, what what happens in, in in Africa, for example, uh, during the colonial areas. They attack mostly uh, black uh, men's genitals uh, so that they can limit the, the, the number of, of they con not not limit but control who produces kids and all who doesn't produce kids and, and such things. And the, there is studies that have shown that the, the white police uh, in, in the U.S. fears the black man and overestimates the power of the black man, even though uh, uh, that black man may just be a teenage child or a teenage, they overestimate the strength of the black man. So there is something to it. I wouldn't uh, count it out uh, uh, totally. There might, might be more studies uh, further to, to uh, support what Dr. Wasson says uh, in her books. And other things, of course, I don't agree with completely, but there are things that say on the psychological level we should be on the lookout for. I mean, yeah. I I think I think we tend to. Well, that's what I'm saying. It, it would be better if we had theories that really, uh, really got to this. Because one thing that we know from white people's literature, at least, is that they did fear, uh, uh you know, what we call slave revolt. You know, or they feared that Africans would revolt because the thing is that it was a system that they would like. For instance, white people have revolted against their own enslavement you know and that's partly why white people are not enslaved today you know uh and, and uh, you know because they revolted against their enslavement so you know it's something that you would expect of a people like you do not expect the people to be really that docile from all the abuses going on so yes white people do uh do that and then not just that but also you know when you look at the policing system you have to realize that we are technically a foreign population you know, uh, particularly in America, we're a foreign population, and and it, and it applies anywhere. You know, like even if, like you go to South Africa, and the things that they say about certain other African groups is 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 is, is, is and this is this is while there's like rampant crime in South Africa. You know, so so the South African may say, oh, I don't like these Nigerian immigrants, while 
the South African men might be, you know, doing a whole bunch of, you know, bad stuff. But 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 that's exactly how that's called nativism. That's called looking at the foreign population as worse, or even using the citizen, you know, using the gloves on your own people. So so the white man is not going to, you know, beat and harass his own people, but he will beat and harass your people because at the end of the day, your people are the problem for him, not so much him having people. You know, he doesn't have a problem with people. He's the problem with your people. And uh, I don't think it ties... I mean, I'm not going to say that there's no white people who say, hey, you know what? These these black folk might out-popular... Might, might out-popularize... I mean, uh, might be become a m m majority. We might, we might not maintain our genetic majority. But it has less to do with them... And I mean, and eventually, of course, if white people were not the the the, the, the majority, they could be wiped out genetically, obviously. Uh, so yes, they would want to limit white people, black people's population. But that's not the same as saying that black people, like 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 one to one, the black person could annihilate the white person. No, one to one, the black person and the white person, you know, have no like like they just meld, and then it depends on what where that mulatto goes. So if the mulatto goes to the white person, then the descendants will be white. And if the mulatto goes to the black person, the descendants will be black. Uh, you know, at least at least according to most people. But but otherwise, uh, no, there's no there's no such thing as you know. But what, what how we think is that the mulatto and the white person make a black person, and that's just pseudoscience, and that's just wrong, and that's something that a lot of people are taking from Francis Cress Wells in literature. And what it does is it does this confusion where we're not really looking for the solution of our own genetic purity. So what I would say for genetic purity is that we as Africans who, well, particularly the Africans who might be in the diaspora, who might have a mixture with us, we should seek partners on the continent, if you will, that are, are even, you know, I mean, not necessarily, not 100% of the time, but, but it would be advised that if you're looking to have an African offspring, you would look for Africans of more pure genetic coding as opposed to pretending that we, uh, you know, anybody of any sort of uh, mixed ancestry is black, you know, because if, if you, because even if you look at something, somebody like Nearly Fuller Jr., right, you know, he might not necessarily, like, he wouldn't be the blackest phenotype uh, uh, in America, right? But he would be, but, you know, he's esteemed as a black person. And when you esteem Nilly Fuller Jr. as a black person, and not to say that, not to, not to go either say that he is or isn't, but just to esteem him as a black person and saying that, oh, if, you know, if two people looking like Nilly Fuller Jr. had a child, though, they would not come out looking like, that, like, they, 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 like, the genetic material, like, they could look either way. They could look like a pure white person. They could look like a, 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 a darker person. But, but the reality is that the genetic material is already so... Uh, messed up t to the point where, you know, realistically speaking, what you would want to do is you would want to encourage, you know, uh, all of us really in, in the diaspora to, to, to mix with continentals. I'm not saying that's 100% because obviously if, you know, two people in the diaspora want to get together, they should. But, but, but the reality being that that would be the bigger and wider takeaway because it, it's more scientifically sound and it's less on the pseudoscience of of you know oh here's this great black man Nelly Fuller Jr. you know and and it's like wait a moment you know because you're already promoting the dissolution of our race you know yeah I agree with that hey I want to jump into something I know we got uh 15 minutes or so left so I know brother Kush says he's not really into you know spirituality and, and religion but I think this is an important point because although I already knew this before reading this book. You know, this is something good to cover. So, uh, page 172. I'm going to read the bottom paragraph. You want to bring it up on the screen, Tony? Wait, what, 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 what page is that? 172. 172? Oh, hold on a second. Let me just turn off my alarm. All right. Uh, let's see if I can. Am I on this? Let me see. Let me see. And I think even, I think Brother Kush is, is going to agree with this as well, even though he doesn't adhere to any religion or spirituality. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. you agree that you don't want, you don't believe black people should be following any white religion, white imagery, white deities, right? None at all. None, none, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. Okay, so I'm gonna read it here. Page 172. 
To be black and accept consciously or unconsciously the image of God as a white man is the highest possible form of self-negation mm. and lack of self-respect under the specific conditions of white domination. Such perception, emotional response, and thought are therefore insane. This logic circuit ensures that black people always will look up to white people and therefore down upon themselves. Only by breaking that logic circuit can the concept of black and other non-white liberation become a reality. This is the direction in which we blacks must prepare ourselves, propel ourselves as we enter the 21st century. So as you all know, this is still an issue all throughout the diaspora, all throughout the continent. You see the white Jesus and you see, you know, the following of Arab Islam. So you have Eurocentric Christianity and Arab, and Arab Islam being predominant in the African world. So there is the issue. You know, spiritually, we are slaves to non-Africans, right? To Europeans and to Arabs. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, like I said, I think, I, I think there are good things in the book. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I finished it, you know. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't throw it away. I mean, yeah, I think, I think there's definitely good things in the book. It's, it's uh, really, it's, it's really for me. It's, it's what is like when you, when you, when you look back, what is it that we're doing? You know, we can easily say, you know, don't go to, uh, like, like, like I go back to the Malcolm X example all the time. The Malcolm X example is, he says, don't tell people that their glass is dirty. Show them a clean glass. So what I don't do, like like for instance, you know, you tell somebody the glass is dirty, they might go atheism. You know, you tell them the glass is dirty, they say, oh, Christianity is garbage, they go to Islam. You say, oh, Islam and Christianity is garbage, they go to Buddhism. They say, oh, Islam, you know, they go to atheism. What I do, what I would do is I would say go to Amon. You know, so I looked up what was one of the ancient African spiritual systems, and I said, okay, let's just let's just do this is the clean glass. You know, and and that's that that's the big difference. I think if you have the opportunity, that you shouldn't just say, "Oh, look, there's a dirty glass." You know, like like the same with this whole, you know, white people, white people effeminizing black people. Yeah, they're going. It's their nation. They can do whatever they want in their nation. When we have strong nations, we'll do whatever we want. You know, that's that's what it is. But 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 if if it's their nation, they can do whatever they want. I I. I if they want to dress your children up in dresses, they can do that. Like, they have us wearing suits. Why are we wearing suits if not because they told us to do it? We're wearing uniforms. Exactly. Yeah, on that point about, about, about the white Jesus, uh, white God, and that, that is a valid point from the book. Uh, and I tweeted that uh, it was 12, chapter 13, I think, you were reading from. It's a valid, valid point because from Africa, for example, I don't know, maybe Brother Unoka can tell me more as well, from Nigeria's perspective, is that, yes, a lot of the people that we grew up with, a lot of the people that go to churches today in Africa, they do pray to a white guy. It's no, no secret. Whenever you hear people give testimonies, it's always, uh, it was a great white man with great white hair and coming down the clouds and blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, and it, spirituality, I don't mind people being spiritual and religious and all that. Uh, I don't mind that as long as you, you practice it in private and such thing. I'm more focused on, on, especially for Africans, and my focus is completely just for Africans from all over the world, is we have to be practical in certain things. And yes, this is probably from this book. What we can get from the book is how how much of it we can put in practice so that we can push our agenda forward, whether it be you, you in the U.S., in Africa, or wherever you are. That, that part of spirituality, white spirituality, white religion is destructive for our community. It's, I've seen it with my own eyes. It's completely destructive. You see how it has been impoverished people. People have become completely poor because they give so much to a religion that is not theirs. Yes, probably the best way is to go back to the African uh, way of, of, of raising or whatever uh, entity you, you think is. I'm not the person to, to show you that person because I, I don't really look into that. I look more into the practical way of doing things, science, uh, apply, applying real science to Real, uh, real issues in our world and solving our issues in, in the world that we're living in. Uh, what 
pertains to the spiritual, I uh, leave it to the experts, not, not to me, yes. <laughs> All right, so all right, so Afro Native was on my case about me going overtime. So, I mean, I could go overtime, but you know, I know Afro Native doesn't want me to. So, <laughs> so all right, any, anybody, some give some last thoughts. Uh, Afro Native, actually, Asani, give us some last thoughts, please. Okay, um, my last thought, I'm gonna have to just again revert back to logic, and if there are people listening now or even after you, um post the broadcast to just focus on, like the brother was saying, those parts of the book later on in the book that um, really hone in on issues that are realistic, relatable, that you can identify within our diaspora populations, and that practical applications can be uh, added to in order to combat um, the various types of oppression we face, specifically the psychological. So you recommend people go and read the book thoroughly and uh, do what? I mean, what, what do you recommend? Well, no, I said if you're going to read the book, focus in on the parts of the book that are more logical and relatable. So skip, so skip around, you said? With, specifically with where she talks about um, the psychological, different types of psychological. Okay, all right, uh, Brother Kush, you, you skip skip around the book or read it thoroughly. What what, what is it? No, um, read read it all, read it twice, read it three times. Right. I mean, uh, with, with anything uh, published by a black author, black scholar, read it three times. Uh, yes, I I. I I give everyone the benefit of the doubt that they will be able to discern from themselves for themselves what uh, what is good and what is not. And if not, then seek. I mean, for us as a black community, what we need to do is have more of this kind of uh, of, of uh, interaction, so we can like point to the people what what really is right in the book and what what we make today. Uh, curated, like uh, like uh, the brother said earlier. But yeah, I recommend it to anyone to read it. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to make Afro Native close it. So before that, I'm going to say, I'm going to do what I usually do, which is I tell people that I wrote a book, uh, too. Uh, so the brother said that you should read books, you should go read my book. My book is the book of power. But otherwise, uh, you're on the Pro Back Perspective, and Afro Native, can you close us out? I guess you have seven minutes. I mean, I mean, I mean we, you can continue the conversation, I guess, but uh, let us know. Uh, let us know what you're saying. Yeah, so I'm I would say, you know, if you're a critical thinker, read a whole book, right? It depends where your mind is at. You know, if you got a young mind, like I would say somebody that has more experience should point out the chapters they should go read, right? So, like, you know, I could point out chapters and and really excerpts that I want to hand off to my 12-year-old. I'm not going to have this whole book. I won't give this whole book to my 12-year-old to read. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't want him believing a lot of stuff in here. So I'm gonna pick out, like what I did today, I'm gonna pick out some expert excerpts and I'm gonna hand those off and like, this is what you need. You know, if you're a critical thinker, read the whole thing. Sorry, so what? let me ask you this then, what grade level would you recommend this book? I would say uh, grade level is gonna have to be somebody that got more mature thinking, right? So it's gonna be like 11th to 12th grade. 11th, 12th grade. I mean, do you recommend this book before or after being learned? Like, do you recommend this as a book to learn about African nationalism or what a pan Africanism, or do you recommend this book? No, I don't. Oh, Asana, you don't? I don't personally. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree with you from uh, Grade 12, 11, 12, yeah, it's good. At that point in time, you start asking questions a lot more. Mm. Questions in, in the, so, yeah, yeah. Is this an introductory text, or is this more of a text to supplement your learning, you know, after you're curious about something? And what would you be curious about to pick up this book? So that's what I'm saying. Like, the things I picked out, it could be introductory, like that whole concept about the white God and all that. That can help you, mm -hmm. right? So you can steer away from that. So there's certain things in here that, you know, there's good guidance. You know, like, there's excerpts I will pick out for introductory, you oh. know, uh, reasoning. Okay, so Asani. Oh, I was gonna ask Asani. Uh, Asani, 
what what would you so you said you wouldn't recommend this as the introductory text so w when would you recommend this I would not recommend this as an introductory text and I would not put a grade level on it mm -hmm. because when it comes to black consciousness and um, African-centered thought, uh, black researchers, things like that, it really depends, one, on the person's level of maturity, um, where they are in life and what they already understand or what they have been taught about history. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think this is a good... I, I think if we were in the 90s, this would have been a good introductory text. Because <laughs> that's kind of where the thought process was in the 90s. I don't think it works as an introductory text now. Mm -hmm. um, Let me and add I don't know that I would be giving it to anyone under the age of 16. Mm -hmm. But right. I'm not really ready to put a grade level on it because, again, it, it, comes, it comes back to maturity and understanding and what that person has already learned and been exposed to and where their mind is. That's let, let, kind of where I am. Let me say it this it way. There's a lot of different things that depends on. Let me say it this way. If we had a African nationalist education system, like, you know, young African children are going through uh, primary to secondary and then all the way up to tertiary, when would you, like, when would you expect, like, would you expect this to be a required reading or an, uh, uh, an optional reading, and then and what kind of a course would it be an optional reading, and what kind of a uh, oh if it were optional, or or when like like what is the timing of it like what is the timing of all of this? Okay, well if it, if that was our school system and the way that our children were um, educated on a mass yeah w would you put it in there and why and when? We can't hear you. Hello? Can you guys hear anybody? Can anybody hear me? Hold on. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got you. Um, a lot of these theories are outdated. Mm. And so I would put it in um, required reading only to get the kind of basis of where, you know, our teachers from that era were coming from and then the works that were built upon their thoughts. What class? Or what what subject? What what grade? What, what subject? What year? Like like what what like what grade? I would definitely I would definitely have it in high school. Um, in high school? If, again, if that was our school structure, somewhere in high school. Required? Um, okay, interesting. I wouldn't have it before that. Okay, so all right, so what about cushion affirmative? I mean, we technically only have two minutes, but I think it's an interesting question. Where would you guys put it? Yeah, I, I said uh, grade 12, but as recommended, like, I agree with uh, Sunny. Uh, yeah, no, not Wait. as a requirement. Not no, as a requirement, no. okay. Recommended, but, um, okay. Advisable to read, I mean, to, to alert you of the dangers of, of the psychological wars that we're facing as black people, yeah, I would recommend it to my students, yeah. Okay, Afro-Native, what would you say? You know, I was thinking about that question as y'all were talking, and, uh, you know, it may be too late at that age because, as you're seeing now, they're introducing a lot of these, you know, war tactics to our children in the cartoons, mm. right? So it's gotten younger and younger. Like, it used to be, you know, like the older movies, now they put it where our, even our youngest children are watching it in cartoons, you know, mm. like the whole sexuality thing. So... This may need to be introduced earlier, you know, like if your children is now being exposed to that, mm -hmm. you know, like on Netflix and all these different places, Disney. Yeah. Maybe that needs to be a conversation earlier. Yeah. Well, uh, so so what what grade what what so you're saying it's required at a young age to read this? I can't say for the entirety of it. You know, what I'm saying like uh, I want to say. Is required the whole thing. Like there's certain things I pick out mm -hmm. of the book. Okay. You know, like for me, um, because I didn't read this book until now, and I'm in my thirties. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I don't feel like I missed too much by not reading this book. All right. Well, when I, mean, I read Marcus Garvey's book when I was 16, 17. Yeah. And that book changed my life. Yeah, so, that, that's a requirement. For me, that's right there. For reading. Yeah. Let me say this: you're 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 going to be on my case about me overtime, so I might I might want to close it. 
but I'll just say this. Hey, you, know me. you say you had a class, so I'm looking after you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I technically do have a class, but you know, I don't. I don't actually turn my camera on, so it doesn't really matter. I, I'll just log on. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm joking. They, they might actually. They might. What are the, what are they might actually hear. So never mind. Uh, what I could say is this. I, I'll show up a little late. But what I'm saying is this: that I would not recommend this book inside of uh, Africa. Because I, I, see, the, the thing you just said about. Well, you know, they're exposing this to a kid. I think that in an independent African nation, they won't be exposing anything to our children. You know, we will not have their images reaching us, their broadcasts reaching us. Or if it does, then at least the parents would already know this stuff, you know, to, like, avoid... You know, if they're watching... Like, if, you, you know, if, you, if you're watching Korean television, you're going to see... Like, you know, Korean flicks, you're going to see Korean culture, obviously. If you're watching American television, you're going to see American culture, obviously. Uh, so, you know, you already know what you're getting into when you watch American stuff. Uh, but otherwise, uh, for that reason, I would more put it at a graduate level, uh, only for, like, if you're in that psycho, like, like, like Asani's put it highlighting, if you're in that psychological field and you're trying to do some sort of psychological study, psych psychological thing, this would be a good primary source for, like, the thought processes, uh, surrounding, you know, white supremacy and... You know the, the white supremacy ideology, as well as uh, you know what what it would look like manifested. But I don't really I don't think it's a required reading. I would more do it if you were if if we we needed some experts in psychology psychiatry, and they wanted to have some sort of background like like how white people do Freud, you know. But of course white people know that Freud is ridiculous, uh, but but they still have him as a reading. Like on a tertiary level, like at a, on a college level, that they, they would give you Freud to read, but they don't necessarily give you Freud, you know, throughout you know your education, and and that's what I would do with uh, with 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 Francis Creswell thing. I, I think, but but you know, but but the thing is this too that everybody knows Freud was ridiculous and perverted, uh, and I don't think Francis Creswell thing was you know any of those stuff, uh, uh, you know. But I would say that that's what I would say. Uh, anybody, anyone else have any comments? I mean, you know, you're taking it to my class time, but. And otherwise, you know, you could say, you know, your goodbyes and all that. But I want to say this, too. I appreciate everybody coming on. Uh, I appreciate all the insight. I, you know, Kush, Asani, and Afro Native, and all the other people standing around. Uh, it was it was very good to have you guys. And hopefully you guys can come on again for a different topic or the same, uh, or whatever you guys want. And maybe I'll take Afro Native's example. What? All right. Maybe. What is he saying? Somebody just, I think Machiavelli just came in. Yeah, Machiavelli is probably saying something vulgar while we're online. Worship, worship, Sunday on worship. Oh, oh, I thought you were saying bullshit. I was like, I thought you were saying bullshit. Like, like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, I appreciate you guys. He's like, bullshit. You're like, what? Oh, yeah, okay, so yeah, tomorrow I'm going to have a worship around the same time, 11 o'clock. Uh, worship as in W A R S H I P. It's a play on words. I mean, because all, all religion is worship, you know? So even though Kush doesn't like religion, the reality is that all that religion is war. It's about war, and that's why they do it. But, um, all right. So Afro-Native Kush, Asani, you guys can feed, share your thoughts. What do you think? And, and whether you like the platform or not, or whatever. I love it. I love it. Great, great, uh, great platform. Yeah, I uh, hope we have more. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to join in for, for the, any other ones. Thanks, thanks for just inviting me. Love it. Yeah, appreciate you. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to Oni, man. Appreciate love you uh, taking this on. You know, because I have a couple people. You know, so people ain't respond. People ain't want to do it. So hey, you took it on, even though you had read it a long time ago. You said, hey, no problem. You set the time. So yeah, I appreciate love that. Oh, well, thanks, sir. Thanks for the invitation, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, Itzan, you got anything to say? Um, just thank you for having me on as well. Thank you for working with me through yet another set of technical issues, and I'm glad that I can contribute something. And I appreciate all the other panelists. I like. I think we have some good energy, good vibes, and I do hope that we do it again soon. Oh, oh, thank you. I hope we weren't too negative for you. You know, I know you were like, wait, did I put my <laughs> did I put my name on this? <laughs> like what? <laughs> These brothers. <laughs> but all right, thank you so much, everybody. I'm gonna log out. You know, you guys, you guys don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So, uh, now I'm just <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna say bye to the WhatsApp. I'm gonna say bye to the uh, 
the uh, the uh, the YouTube. Let me see. I think Mercedes said something. The part of this book where she talks about white women and sex and everything, she said is completely playing out playing out through cuckold and humiliation fetish on Discord. The male response to their white women wanting to commit genetic annihilation is playing out with the alt right and 4chan. So she's saying that the she's saying that the cuckold humiliation fetish is going on on Discord. Oh, I don't know if Mercedes is a woman actually. It just has a woman. It's just a woman avatar. Uh, but the other one is that there's a 4chan and the alt right is worried about uh, genetic annihilation. Will be utilized through education, but not the book. We can hear you. Social science, long-winded answers. Yeah. So what? What do you? What? What? what I mean. All right. Yeah. I guess we. Unless somebody has something to say about that. No. All right. So I'll I'll, I'll end the stream, and that's all. Okay. So have a nice one, everybody. This is the Pro Black Perspective on KWZ Radio. Make sure you do some likes. Make sure you do some shares, and you can subscribe too. And if you want more content like this, leave a comment below and say get those people back on. All right. Shemi Motep. Uh, all right. <laughs> I am. Thanks, brother. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, all right. You guys could. Uh, 